Well hello and welcome to another Waters and Stanton video. A slightly different video today. I'm actually at Centre Parks uh, in Woburn and uh, got a few days holiday with the family and the grandchildren. So things aren't terribly quiet, but there are times when it's quiet enough to enjoy a bit of ham radio. Now, if you're one of these hams that have got lots of gear, you've got big linear amplifiers, big antennas, big garden, lots of ground, lots of ancillary equipment, and uh, love working DX, just switching on and working all over the world because you can, because you've got the power and you've got the antennas. Well, maybe this video is not for you, so maybe it's time to switch off now. If, on the other hand, you're a more simple ham radio operator. Now, I don't mean that rudely. No, I mean, if you're a ham radio operator that just wants some simple gear, get some simple enjoyment out of ham radio, then perhaps this video is more for you. Because the others have switched off now, they've gone. They're back on the DX. So it's just you and me having a chat about ham radio. Now, I have to confess that I've done it all. When I first became licensed back in 1960. We all started on 160 meters, or at least most of us did. We had a 10 watt power limit, and that was 10 watts input power, not 10 watts output power. So it's rather like running five watts on 160 meters today. Well, that power limitation wasn't always observed. And in fact, it wasn't unusual to have 813s and three or 400 watts going out on 160 meters in order to work the DX and the main object, the main sort of target was to work across the pond into America and it wasn't too difficult with that sort of power if you had a long length of wire, say around about 100, 150 foot of wire, you could manage it. We were operating totally illegally but then common sense prevailed and we wanted to operate on other bands and SSB came along etc etc. About Five or six years ago, I went to America and I stayed with a, a ham radio operator who had one of the largest amateur radio stations in the world. He had a four element 40 metre Yagi at 150 foot. He had um, three four element 20 metre Yagis phased. And I operated that station. He had, a, he had a separate linear amplifier for each, uh, each band, two kilowatt amplifier for each band. And I had the pleasure of operating that station because it wasn't actually that operational. And I spent one evening there operating and working all over the world. 40 meters was a great delight. I could work straight into Europe and get S9 reports and get a pile up. And on 20 meters, I got the same result, five, nine plus all over the world, just point, pointed the beam in the right direction and away you went. But on the third evening, I thought, do you know, I'm not really sure whether I want to operate really, because I know I can operate and work stations all over the world, and I know I'm going to get good reports. And the challenge wasn't there. And it really dawned on me that for me, amateur radio was basically a form of experimenting and a form of challenge. And if there wasn't any challenge there, for me, amateur radio wasn't really a hobby. And I'm sure there's many of you out there that have got the same state of mind. You enjoy ham radio, but you enjoy ham radio for the challenge. Not, you don't want all that gear. You don't want acres of ground. Nice to have it, I suppose, but you don't want acres of ground and you don't want to be surrounded by lots of lots of bright lights and hand radio equipment. Nothing wrong with that. If you enjoy that, great. But I think sometimes potential hand radio operators, newcomers, can be put off by seeing all the gear that some of these stations have got. And they think, gracious me, I couldn't afford that. Now it's a hobby I can't afford. Well, I think that's wrong because you can enter the hobby at a much lower price level, far less gear, and yet probably get just as much, even more enjoyment than some of these guys 
They'd have to wake up in the middle of the night when there's a storm blowing, wind their antennas down, wind their masts down, and think, oh, gracious me, if that falls down, there'll be all sorts of problems. So the, the operator that, right, that operates at a lower level doesn't have that sort of problem. You know, Bradcom has got uh, some interesting articles dotted around. It's not the most interesting magazine for me, but there are some interesting uh, pages in there. And one of the best columns for me recently has been a, the HF section because it doesn't concentrate purely on the guys that have got lots of gear and work all over the world. It also mentions guys that have got much more simple stations. And to me, that really is the heart of ham radio. So, here I am at Centre Parks and I'm going to try and set up a simple amateur radio station because I'm a simple guy, <laughs> believe it or not. And talking about basics, I've even hired a bike. I still enjoy cycling, even at the age of 80. Got up this morning and got a, it's rather a wet saddle because it hasn't rained actually, but <laughs> there's a lot of dew on it, so I'm going to have to clean that off. But I still enjoy uh, riding the bike, particularly if it's in a nice, quiet place. And of course, at Centre Parks, it's well, it's quiet in terms of traffic. It's not quiet in terms of people, but it's quiet in terms of uh, traffic. So that's quite enjoyable. I have to admit that when I came to Centre Parks, I meant to bring with me a short telescopic mast. And unfortunately, I left it at home. So I've got a bit of a problem now because it's rather tantalised. If I turn the camera around, you'll see well, there's lovely tall trees. Well, there's no way I can get an aerial up there because I've got no way of getting it up there. Perhaps I should have bought a catapult. But uh, looking around, I'm going to have to make do with some sort of low wire from the lodge here to perhaps sort of that uh, bush there. It may be, I don't know, eight, nine foot above the ground. And it's a possibility. And if we walk around the back, whoa. It's rather tantalising, really, because we've got all those trees. And wouldn't it be nice if I could have got my mast to uh, be uh, strapped somewhere along there? And I could have got a wire up around about 20 foot, wood, which would have been quite good. But, uh, ah, well, there we are. We'll have to make do with uh, what we can. So that's my challenge at the moment, <laughs> to get an aerial up and see if I can... Uh, do something that's uh, rather rather annoying but anyway it's one of those things this is the operating position of the zigu 6100 little cw key it's uh, working quite satisfactorily actually and have you spotted what's missing yep i haven't put the ferrite core on the antenna kyx which i should do because when i'm tuning the uh, atu when i'm pressing the atu and then I touch the transceiver. I see the SWR rise as I touch the chassis of the transceiver. So I do need a ferrite core, which I'm going to put on now. I actually found for 20 meters, I only need a couple of turns and that cures the problem. Obviously, probably another two turns for 40 meters. And uh, I'm not operating on any bands lower than 40 meters. So uh, that'll probably do the job. I boosted the power because I've got an external power supply. This is the Jackery. 12 volt battery supply which I use extensively that's connected to the uh, transceiver I normally run the transceiver at around about 8 watts to keep the uh, heat down a bit that uh, is more than enough to get me around Europe quite uh, easily the setup was pretty basic well the first setup was pretty basic I've got a 9 to 1 unun and then around about 2.5 meters of coax cable which is just going through the window into the transceiver and as you can see the aerial wire runs up to the pipe and the wire goes along into a bush there, I'm not sure you can see it, it's just hanging over the bush. Very simple, but you know, when needs must, one has to use that. Now an alternative to the 9 to 1 Anun is what I call a floating auto ATU. This ATU is the LDG one, which is actually designed for the IC705 but um, it works equally well with uh, other QRP transceivers. I, I think it's rated 100 watts. Anyway, basically what I do is I connect the wire antenna 
to the antenna uh, connection on the ATU. The coax cable goes back to the transceiver, but I've got no earth. I'm relying on that coax cable to act as a short counterpoise. And it seems to do it quite well. I've got a line isolator just inside before the coax goes into the transceiver. But really and truly, it works extremely well. And I would say that the performance is better than the 9 to 1, nine to one Unun. What I've really done is simply replaced the 9 to 1 Unun with uh, an antenna tuning unit. But instead of providing any separate earth, I've relied on the coax cable, the short length of coax cable, about two and a half metres, to act as a counterpoise, and it seems to work quite well. No problems at all. It works, it tunes all bands. I should add that this particular antenna tuner has got internal batteries, which are quite convenient. And because the relays are latching, it uh, requires very little current. It only, only draws current when the ATU is tuning and after that uh, in the standby mode there's virtually no current drain at all so batteries last for ages. Now I would say that direct connection of a wire to a QRP transceiver even such as this with a built-in ATU is not a good idea unless you have an earth. You do need an earth or a counterpoise otherwise you're going to get build up of voltage on the chassis. So don't make a wire connection directly to the transceiver without a wire uh, counterpoise um, that's uh, rather essential and with a with a wire of modest uh, length about uh, four, four or five meters usually you can get the, the uh, radio to tune the uh, bit of wire from 40 meters up to 10 meters without any problem there are several things that you might want to invest in when you're playing around with non-resonant antennas this is my homeway, homemade 9 to 1 Anun, but you can purchase a 9 to 1 Anun from us. The LDG Anun is very popular and not overly expensive. On this one, I've used the BNC uh, connector, and you'll see a little wire there. That wire there is just an earth connection which I, I made when I was doing some tests, but I've got a BNC connector there because it's small enough to fit onto this uh, box, which I got from Radio Spares actually. On the other end, I've got a terminal which I attach the wire, it's just a screw terminal. The ferrite core I use as a line isolator or RF choke is the 240-43 ferrite mix. It works extremely well. The coax cable I use is RG58 because it's very flexible and uh, the sort of length I'm using, there's no significant loss. If you look carefully, you'll see that I've got some shrink wrap. Uh, what I do is, where the reducer is on the uh, coax plug. Um, I put a bit of shrink wrap around that and then onto the cable and apply heat to shrink it on and that stops any wear and tear when the cable is moved around. An item that is very useful is this terminal, <laughs> terminal block fitted with a BNC connector on one end and a, um, an earth and positive connection on the other end. The positive goes to the center point on the BNC and the earth goes to the shank. That's very uh, um, useful for connecting wire straight onto a QRP transceiver that's got a BNC a connector on it. If you've got a cable with a PL259 plug on the end, then this little adapter is quite useful. Uh, one end has got a, an SO239 socket for your coax cable, the other end has got a BNC which will go in to your QRP transceiver. And sometimes you'll want the reverse of that. Um, you might have a BNC connector and you want to convert it to PL259. So you want one of these adapters and I'll try and remember to put the uh, links for these adapters below this video. This is a typical setup using uh, an external antenna tuner. I've got the transceiver here, 
This is the Zego 6100. I've got the internal ATU turned off so I can um, just rely on the remote ATU. That's something you must do. You must turn the ATU off in the transceiver, otherwise you get all sorts of confusion. And then I've got around about two meters and a bit of coax. And that's feeding the antenna tuner here. Effectively, the antenna tuner is like is sort of like a well, it's sort of floating uh, because I'm using the outer sheathing of the coax as a short counterpoise. So if you imagine this ATU being replaced by something like a nine to one Anun, which has which is a fixed transformer, the advantage of the ATU is that it's effectively a variable transformer and it can provide a very good match. In this case, I've got the wire just going up to guttering downpipe there. And I uh, don't know sure whether the camera will pick this up actually. The uh, wire goes down to some uh, shrubs there. It's around about uh, 10 or 12 metres long. It's a typical, perhaps emergency setup, but equally, it's a very interesting low power setup. And uh, it does work extremely well. Now to give you some idea of how good the match is with the ATU, I've unplugged the coax from the transceiver, plugged it into the rig expert here, and you can see how good the VSWR is. I've resonated the remote ATU at the bottom of 20 metres, and you can see you get a very good VSWR, and quite a sharp dip actually, so good front end selectivity. So the remote VSWR, sorry, the remote antenna tuner is doing its job. The question is, is it doing it better than something like a 9 to 1 Anon? Hmm. Could be, couldn't it? Well, it was an interesting few days of operation, ham radio. Ham radio, portable HF operation or emergency HF operation. I think recent events have shown that if the internet goes down, or if the mobile telephone system goes down, or both systems go down, then direct HF radio communication is a serious option. It's a serious alternative. Now, you know, you can actually make any bit of wire radiate. The secret is actually getting the energy into the wire system, or the antenna system. It's all very well having resonant antenna systems, and the reason that we have resonant antenna systems is because very often they're very easy to feed. You don't need an antenna matching unit. And you can predict, to some extent, the radiation pattern. But we're not always in that situation. So if you run out a random length of wire, yes, it will radiate, and it will radiate quite efficiently, provided you can feed the energy into that bit of wire. In other words, you've got to get that energy from the transceiver into the bit of wire. And one of the ways that we often do it is with an antenna matching unit. And you can actually regard that as something like a, a variable transformer, variable ratio transformer, which also gets rid of the reactants. The net result is we get a decent VSWR. And if we've got a shortish length of coax cable going to that antenna tuning unit or matching unit, we don't lose anything at all, really. It's insignificant. It's well below a dB. And of course, we can directly connect the wire to the transmitter or the transceiver, provided and this is very important, you have some sort of counterpoise because otherwise you'll get RF on the chassis. And also don't forget that inline choke, that's uh, very important with coax cable. So I enjoyed myself and I hope uh, it's given you a few ideas, a few tips, and uh, you may be able to build on that and come up with your own uh, systems and combinations. It's all great fun. And it's always good to get out in the fresh air, isn't it? Anyway, thanks for watching this video. Thanks for your support on this channel. And I've put a link below this video to some of the items that uh, you may want. And we carry those in stock at uh, Waters and Stanton in Milton Keynes. So don't forget to uh, check our website out. Or if you've got any questions, give the guys a ring and tell them that you saw the video. It always helps. Anyway, in the meantime, enjoy Ham Radio. Take care. And as usual, I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye for now.